mechanical features. Compared to a vehicle in today's world, this truck was like a Flintstone era machine. Remember that it was about an early 1950s Chevy truck that had many, many miles on it. It probably should have been sent to the scrapyard for recycling, but I bought it and used it for five years or so. It had no air conditioning, no power steering, no power brakes, no defroster, and it had a four-speed manual transmission. With that first gear, you could pull a freight train, but would only top out at about two miles per hour in first. We usually did not use first, we just took off in second, and then third and fourth. It had turn signals, but they were not reliable. Most of the time I had to stick my left arm out the door to signal right or left turns. There was a window in the door, but it was not made to open, so you had to slide the door open to stick your arm out. There was a windshield wiper, but only on the driver's side. It worked off the vacuum in the intake manifold. Therefore, the speed of the wiper was affected by whether you were running steady or not. If you were accelerating, the wiper would almost stop in place until you let up on the gas pedal. It was a great improvement to all vehicles when they started putting electric motors on the wipers. The design was stub-nosed, which meant that the motor was almost right beside the driver's seat. It had a metal hood over it and you could lift it up inside the truck to check the oil and do maintenance on the motor. It was a good thing that I learned about mechanics as a kid. It took a lot of maintenance to keep this thing on the road. Everything on the truck was worn out. I imagine the shocks, the brakes, the tires, about every moving and even non-moving parts were needing replaced. The steering wheel had about 30 degrees of play in it. In other words, you could turn the steering wheel four or five inches before it actually turned the wheels. I would say that the tie rod ends needed replaced. You just got used to driving it with all that play in the wheel. Every year when you renewed the license plates, you had to take it in for inspection. There was a place down in Westville where all trucks were inspected. It always passed. It seemed like they were more interested in the headlights being set at the right level than anything else that was really a safety issue, like brakes and steering. Smoke on the reservation. It may have been 1970. The villagers were not playing much, and I often volunteered to take other bands to their gigs. After all, I had a band truck, and many of these guys were my good friends. If the gig was out of town, we could get all their equipment and probably all their band members in the same vehicle. There were several friends of mine that had formed a band fashioned after a couple of hit horn groups known as Chicago and Blood, Sweat, and Tears. They called themselves America Incorporated. Most of the band members were going to Danville Junior College and all staying in a rented two-story house. The house was owned by Ed Fawner and was right behind his dry cleaning business. These guys were bound to be a great band. They rehearsed for a solid year in that house before they ever played in public. After all, the music they played was not anything easy. I would drop by the house from time to time and check them out. They were getting really good. One day they said they had decided to play their first gig in Bloomington on campus at a frat house. I immediately said that I would take them to it in the villager truck. They agreed and that next weekend we were off to Bloomington with all that equipment and the boys. What I remember about that event was that everyone there was blown away by how great they were. It wasn't long before word got around about the band and their schedule was filling up. One of the dates was a two-night gig at a place in Pontiac, Illinois, called The Reservation. They liked the traveling in my truck since they could get all that equipment into one vehicle, including Bill Cunningham's Hammond B3 and Leslie Cabinet. Since the job was a Friday and Saturday, and it was a good two hours away, they got a couple of rooms at the Holiday Inn. We checked in, and they went over to the reservation and played the Friday night gig. It was amazing to hear their great sound and songs. Everyone there had a great time, including me. After getting some sleep and checking on the guys, one of the guys suggested that we take a short trip over to Streeter, Illinois, to this music store that was supposed to be a good place for the newest equipment. Some of the guys stayed at the motel, and the rest of us jumped into the truck and headed off to the music store. Hang in there, it is just starting to get interesting. 
We are driving up this county highway with some of the guys enjoying their recreational smoke when all of a sudden, boom, the entire inside of the truck fills up with smoke. Good golly, what the heck? I pulled the truck over to the side of the road, not knowing what else to do, and we all got out. We all stood there in amazement of what had just happened. After a minute of two, the smoke cleared from the truck and I walked over and looked inside. Wow, the engine was still running. So I got into the driver's seat and it all looked the same as before. I said, I don't know what happened, but it's still running, so get in. Well, they all got in and we took off for the music store. After a short drive, we found the place. One of the guys in the band, I think the bass player, was from that area and knew where we were going. He said it's right up that drive, which was a long gravel driveway. It turned out that the famous music store was in the basement of this guy's house, which was on a farm. We spent some of the afternoon there at the so-called store, but I don't think anyone actually bought anything. Oh, maybe some guitar picks or something. The entire time I am in a quandary and trying to figure out what is going on with the truck. Then we're on the road again back to Pontiac, having their usual fun in the truck like normal 18 to 20 year old musicians do, we are rolling along on the county road. Then, boom, it happens again. It's like a smoke bomb has gone off. Same routine. Pull over, get out, let the smoke clear, then back on the road. This has really got me nervous and wondering what's next. Well, we got back into town and over to the Saturday night gig. The house is packed and the band is cooking. Me, I'm still scratching my head, trying to figure out what is happening with the truck. I can't wait any longer. While the band is playing, I go out back to the truck and I want to see if I can find out what's going on. After all, I'm a pretty good amateur mechanic. This truck has the motor mounted inside the truck and just to the right of the driver with a metal hood or cover over it. I start the motor and lift the hood to get a good look at the motor and everything else I can see down there. In the dark, I need my flashlight, so after finding it in the overhead compartment, I show it down on the motor. I'm looking here, and I'm looking there, and everything looks normal. Maybe I need to crawl down a little farther. Then, boom! Oh, my, am I still alive? What has happened to me? The dang thing decided to do it again, just as I'm sticking my head down beside it. I don't know what it did to me, but it probably blew a hole in my face or something. Lucky for me, it just covered my head with oily, filthy, smoky stuff. Well, I shut it off, gathered myself together, and went inside to the men's room. As I looked in the mirror, I saw a black face with white rings around his eyes like a raccoon. After all the care and tender loving I had given to that truck, it was not very nice what it did to me that night. I went in and told the band after their gig that they would have to find another way home. It was sad, but the old truck could not be trusted to get us back. So we locked their equipment in the truck for the night and we all got back to Danville, somehow. The neighbor that I had purchased the truck from a few years before, Chuck Porter, had a tow truck. I called him and he said he would go get the truck and tow it back home. He did, and really didn't charge me as much as he should have. I was able to find out what the problem was. It certainly was a mystery at the time. For you mechanics, it was a hole in a piston. As the truck was running, it would cause compression to bypass the piston and go into the crankcase where the oil is held. As the pressure builds, it finally unloads out through the breather cap or fill tube. I had to get the truck in running order again, so I located a used motor to replace this one. Yes, I did do the work myself, right in the driveway at the house on Denmark Road. And yes, that motor led to more stories. Thanks for listening.